Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Bengkel Diplomasi FBCI. This event is brought to you by Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia and the Delegation of the European Union to Indonesia and Brunei Darussalam. First and foremost, we would like to give a warm welcome to our distinguished guest, the Honorable Nicola Beer, the Vice President of the European Parliament. Welcome, Your Excellency. Oh. Um, yes. You may sit, be seated here, yes. Thank you. Dr. Dino? Yeah, please welcome Dr. Dino Patijal, our founder and chairman of FPCI. You may be seated here. Yes. All right. Other than the Honorable Nicola Beer, we would also like to welcome His Excellency Vincent Piquet, the Ambassador of European Union to Indonesia and Brunei Darussalam. So welcome, Ambassador Piquet, um, again to FPCI. And we also would like to welcome our FPCI chapter colleagues. We have around 20 students coming from various universities. We have Universitas Indonesia, we have Pelita Harapan University, we have LSPR Communication and Business Institute, we also have um, Universitas Indonesia. All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Some of you are already familiar with this place, some have not, so welcome and thank you for coming. In this special occasion, we will have a conversation with the Honorable Nicola Beer, so please, uh, just be excited about it because it's going to be very interesting and it will be, be moderated by our founder and chairman, Dr. Dino Pati Jalal. Ladies and gentlemen, before we go out to our main session, we will present to you about uh, a video, a brief video about FPCI and Global Town Hall. So ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy. Wow, so that was a glimpse about FPCI and Global Town Hall. Please give a round of applause. <laughs> and please don't forget to register to our Global Town Hall, ladies and gentlemen. All right, without further ado, I would like to hand over the floor to our host today, the founder and chairman of FPCI, Dr. Dino Patijalal. Dr. Dino, you may have the floor. Thank you, Jen. And I uh, share the enthusiasm of all FPCI family and the chapters who are here today in welcoming you to Indonesia. You are uh, here, uh, Nicola, for uh, the Parliament 20, and I'm sure it has been a very worthwhile uh, experience uh, for you uh, and for our, all our chapters. Uh, uh, the Honorable Nicola Beer, uh, Beer is the Vice President of the European Union Parliament, and she is also the Deputy Federal Chairwoman of the Free Democrats. Uh, she was a member of the German Bundestag, uh, and she was also General Secretary of her party. So uh, you are a true politician. Uh, you're coming from a troubled 
region uh, uh, that is uh, in the midst of uh, war. And uh, I would like to know that I would like you to know that FPCI is very clear about our stand on the Ukraine war, which is we are, we oppose Russia's invasion uh, of uh, Ukraine, which is a sovereign and independent country. And we, like the UN resolution, we call on Russia to withdraw all their troops unconditionally. And we are quite uh, shocked and disappointed by the annexation, illegal annexation that Russia uh, uh, did on uh, the provinces, on the uh, areas uh, within uh, Ukraine. Uh, but uh, you are here uh, in a very difficult and dangerous time for the world. Uh, you are here in Indonesia, which assumes the presidency of the G20, and you are addressing uh, the young people uh, who pay great attention to global issues, uh, who are worried, uh, and who ask a lot of questions. Uh, we are, they are proud to be part of uh, Indonesian democracy. Uh, they have an open mind, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. So the floor is yours, Nicola. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you that you are here, uh, that we can discuss. Um, I think, yes, you're right. Everybody is worried about the future, as we see um, that nearly... Uh, there are forces in the world like Russia not respecting the rules-based international order, uh, trying to uh, put the, the law of the strongest instead of the strength of the law. Uh, and if we let them go with that, uh, then it will change our really uh, living together, uh, especially for so much more mm. countries than mm. only Europe. So this is not a fight uh, in Europe. Uh, on the European continent, but this is really a fight for freedom, for democracy, for rules-based order uh, in the whole world. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we see the impacts also mm -hmm. uh, in the whole world and especially on our citizens. And this for me as a parliamentarian, as I am for over 20 years now, is important because being directly elected by citizens in Europe and being member of a transnational European parliament uh, for me, it's important also in the structure of the G20, and this is the reason we were here, um, to make this voice heard. Uh, mm -hmm. And we see the consequences on our citizens. Uh, we see the rising um, of the prices, of energy costs. We see that they are afraid what could be done next, as now with the shame referenda, with the annexation, uh, Putin is threatening the whole world with nuclear weapons. Uh, and I mean, coming from a continent who was built on the ashes of two world wars and on, uh, with a history where generations were enemy on a continent and came up now with a common transnational parliament directly elected by our citizens is a continent who has the experience that we can do better. And I think we should really be very strong and united on that. Um, that this is for the future and the prosperity of all citizens around the globe. And I mean, we already experienced it with the fight against climate change. Uh, we experienced it in cooperation, so to organize wealth, growth, sustainable growth and prosperity for our citizens. Uh, in the cooperations we have in education, in science, research and development, and you as students coming from different universities reaching out to your colleagues in other universities all around the globe. And I think this is important to get the best of all the ideas, innovation, creativity we can uh, for the best solution worldwide. And so this is a crucial moment. Uh, it's a pity that it's really dominating everything because there are so many conflicts all over the globe. But I think we have to really solve this one. Mm -hmm. And I'm really hoping that we will see also next week in the Assembly of the UN a strong answer uh, to Putin uh, to the annexation of the chamber referendum uh, on the resolution. We are preparing for that and I hope really on the support also of the um, Indonesian Mm. Thank you. Uh, what do you say to those who uh, say, hey, this is a European problem, really? Mm. Yeah. 
I mean, I already mentioned that I think it's a, it's a global problem. Uh, and for me, it's a continuation of a form of imperialism and colonialism. I mean, we see it also in Russian history from Tsar Peter the Great uh, up to, and we saw conflicts, uh, the Russians, especially Putin and his regime and the Kremlin, always tried to solve by overruling uh, other nationalities, especially also the minorities uh, in this part of the world. And here now neglecting that the Ukrainian people are a known nation with right of self-determination, uh, with right to speak their language, uh, with right to live their culture, uh, and cooperating and searching also mm. who, with whom they want to cooperate, makes mm. it clear that mm. this is a form of colonialism. I mean, you have experienced in the former years, and we all have to decide if we want him let go with that, if he can be successful with that, or if we will confront and fight also for the right of self-determination of other people and nations. Okay. I want to take some questions from uh, the students. Uh, maybe I'll take the first one, anyone? Okay, can you say your name also? Uh, and you can take off your mask while you ask questions and put it back on, yes, please. And you can stand up. Okay. Thank you for the opportunities, honorable speakers and the moderator, Ms. Nicola Beer and Mr. Dino Patil Jalal. My name is Rainer and I am come from FPCI chapter Venus University. I would like to ask one question. We know that millions of people have fled to war in Ukraine and to seek refuge in European Union. How European Union ensure the well-being of them and make them feel welcome? That is all for me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for this question. You're totally right. Uh, we see a lot of refugees now coming from Ukraine. I mean, uh, it's not that the European Union and the member states do not have an experience with uh, many migration uh, all over the globe. Often when there are conflicts, uh, and mm. I mean, we had in Afghanistan and Syria and so on, we see with some delay of time refugees coming over to Europe. But I think the Ukrainian case is a little bit different because those refugees come to be safe. It are especially uh, women, mothers with small children, which come without their husbands, without their uh, sons, elder sons. Uh, and they come because they flee a war. They hope to win at the end. So this is the reason why um, the men stay and fight and save the rest of their family. So we try as teens, of course, to prepare a home welcome. Uh, they all have shelter. They all have uh, uh, space to live where. Uh, often also in European families. Uh, we try to integrate them very quickly in our schools, universities, uh, working places as far as possible also with the language. So there are also classes to learn the languages they need to, to live really as integrated part in our societies, but knowing at the same time that they are just waiting for going back as soon as possible. So we have already a lot of the refugees which came in, in February, March, just going back now, looking if it's possible to stay especially in those regions of Ukraine, which were deliberated from the Russian troops, just to rebuild, just to be at home with the rest of their families, uh, or coming back after seeing, okay, it's not stable in us with small children, maybe I stay some months longer. And this is also an uncertainty you have to understand, because they didn't come to stay. They mm. just come to uh, be alive, and then go back. And they do not know if this will take six months, a year, two years, or three. So we have to provide that they can live as an integrated part of European society, uh, but that they also can back, go back in the moment they wish to do. So for example, for the children, uh, especially in our schools, means that we offer the European education 
and in same time make clear that they also can follow the Ukrainian curricula in same time because, I mean, it's clear when going back, not losing too much uh, of the Ukrainian education and being able to follow at home. Uh, and this, of course, is not so easy. The uh, society has to be, pre be prepared for that, especially with the uncertainty how long. I mean, if you just be in, in, in the first month, the family saying, oh, yeah, great, I, I will have, I can give, I have a room, I can host uh, a mother with two children. And then, okay, it's not only for a week, <laughs> it's not only for six weeks, now it's for eight months and could be one year more, of course, then you really have to adapt on the situation on both sides. So it's really not easy, but, but we try to do our best. Okay. Second question. Yes. Uh, Dr. Dino, thank you very much. And uh, Vice President Nicola Beer, thank you very much for the opportunity. So I just want to ask, uh, it's a common fact now that the world is being more and more divided, more and more divided, uh, dangerous day by day. And but we need the big players within global in the global stage. There's also social tensions that are very easy to be triggered. So do you, as a special envoy to combating religious discrimination, do you think that the interfaith relationships between religions is getting better? Oh, well, this is a really difficult question because I think it depends a little bit uh, from which perspective you look at and in which country or continent. Um, and yes, you're right, uh, we see that the world is divided, but in the same time we have more and more of globalization, mm -hmm. so I think we have use in the same time, and this is, I think, um, the point where it's difficult to manage. Uh, and this is also for, for the question of religion. Uh, we see that often um, the discrimination of religions uh, different religions is a, is a reason to flee. And then coming up in a foreign country, maybe even on a foreign continent with a totally different culture, uh, languages, uh, also mixture of religions and other, maybe other reasons for discrimination. And what we try as European Parliament and especially me also as Special Envoy on that question is just to make uh, then to combat, uh, so really to, to be very vocal also in actions uh, for the right of everybody living his style so far that he is respecting our framework of, of rights also of the other. Uh, and yes, uh, I mean, uh, you here in Indonesia have a, a quite similar uh, motto uh, for your living together, uh, uh, that you are united in the diversity you have in your country, and this is also clear, clear for European Union, who has the same mm -hmm. message, being united uh, in the diversity, and that diversity is a reason for creativity, for opportunities, for chances, and not something which should divide us, but unite us, so that we can take the strengths and the potential of everywhere uh, and everybody to make us in common stronger and united. Uh, and we just try to live that uh, by a lot of measures and, and, and means, but clearly it's not easy, especially if you welcome people who then at a certain moment do not respect this diversity and the right of everybody to live his religion or even to live not to have a religion. Mm. Okay. Third question? Yes. Hello, uh, please introduce myself. Let me introduce myself. My name is Felicia Alvira Simajunta, and I'm in NLS PR. And as a part of the youth of the world, we are very worried about what happened in Iran, especially in the case of Masha Amini. We are wondering what are your thoughts on that issues, and are the young people in the European Union are also concerned about this? Thank you. Yes, I think uh, not only the young one, but uh, uh, everybody is and uh, has to be concerned about that. Um, we see that the situation in a lot of countries, too much countries for women, are not becoming better, but worsening. I mean, we see it in Afghanistan, now as the Taliban regime is over. Um, but we see also that from a certain moment, they are rising. They 
speak out for their case. Uh, they are claiming their rights uh, of equality, of living their own lives. And I think we should be uh, very supportive now for the Iranian women, but there are a lot of men also in the demonstrations. I think this is a good mm -hmm. sign mm -hmm. that they are also going out in the streets for their sisters, their mothers, um, their girlfriends uh, to make it. Um, I, for my personal view, point of view, I think that um, we are not loud enough, not vocal enough, not supporting enough uh, for the moment. Um, the problem is the negotiations on the agreement uh, on the nuclear weapons, but I think you cannot say, okay, because we have this problem to deal with, we cannot be vocal on, on the human rights side. So because both has to go together. So I would wish, and we just uh, passed a resolution European Parliament to be very much more active in the case of the Iranian women. Uh, and you might uh, saw the video from one of my colleagues just cut her hair in the mm -hmm. plenary session uh, in the hemicycle to make visible we stand with you. And uh, I think we should join not only as women, but as society really with the case of the Iranian women. Mm. Okay. Anyone? Four. Yes, Her Excellencies and Dr. Dino, my name is Evelyn from University of Indonesia. So I would like to ask uh, your thoughts on the current regression by the Russia towards the Ukraine recently and how does the parliamentary 20 can uh, negotiation about this? Uh, how, how is the recent negotiation between uh, the European Union countries addressing these issues? And since this is a very perfect momentum for all of us to sit and together uh, to discuss between all the country leaders, how do you see the G20 leaders and G20 countries can provide any solutions in addressing the current regression by the Russia towards Ukraine? Yeah, this was the discussion we had now in the P20 uh, with uh, the respective uh, delegates from the different parliaments in the G20 structure. Mm, and I mean, at the end, there was not a common stand, uh, statement. We couldn't reach joint statement uh, also because the Russian delegation was present uh, and just spread out a totally different narrative on that. Um, so, I mean, from our point of view, it's quite clear uh, that the Ukrainians didn't enter Russian territory with tanks, with bombs, uh, with drones. Uh, this was an invasion uh, and a war of aggression from the side of Putin. I wouldn't say from Russia, but from the actual uh, regime, uh, I even wouldn't call it government, uh, in the Kremlin. Uh, but, of course, with the machine of uh, uh, propaganda, with all this disinformation in the Russian society, a lot of them believed first uh, that this is only, it's not a war. Now, I think with the mobilization, they are quite, quite aware of that is a war. And we see now not only refugees from Ukraine, as one of the... Uh, uh, questions before, but we see a lot of refugees from Russia now coming up, young men for the most part, but coming up fleeing not to be part in the war which is not theirs. And so the discussion here in the P20 went on um, and uh, we made quite clear our point um, as uh, friends and allies of democracy and especially of Ukrainian democracy. Uh, that we will support, that we stand, and that we will never recognize the chamber referendum, that we will not recognize the annexation of the territory, that uh, Putin has to lose this war and the Ukrainians have to win. And this is the reason why European Union, so the member states, but also the European Parliament, uh, is very firm on the support. So in financial aid, humanitarian aid, military aid, uh, and also working together for example, parliament by parliament. So we have a very active exchange with the colleagues from the uh, RADA uh, in Ukraine. On uh, We, for example, uh, help them that during the war they could work online uh, so that they could pass uh, the legislation budget. Uh, we help with our experience now they are in the status of a candidate uh, to access the European Union. 
Uh, and so um, there is a lot of working together. And in the same time, we use parliamentary diplomacy to make our stand clear. And we really oppose the colleague which came over from uh, Russia with a huge, huge delegation um, that we are firm on that and that they quite alone. And I hope that we can convince more and more countries also here in the Indo-Pacific region not to stay behind some kind of neutrality, but be on the right page of history in this case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Nicola, before the war happened, uh, we, we were quite happy to see uh, SDGs, uh, uh, development issues, climate issues uh, were at the forefront of uh, international agenda, right? And especially us uh, developing countries, right? And now, uh, especially, uh, not just the geopolitical rivalries, but especially with the in war, uh, we are seeing that the international agenda will be dominated by, by geopolitics, right? Uh, by proxy wars, by, by conflicts and, and, and so on. And that SDGs, these issues, that uh, uh, were on the front agenda will be less important. Now, I'm, I want to ask you, uh, is that uh, the right assumption or am I wrong in saying that? Um, I, will not, I would not say that this is not in the discussion. Uh, if we now have new priorities on that, but uh, uh, from a European perspective, uh, one is even not possible without the other. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, uh, part of the problem we are dealing with, uh, uh, with the impact of the war of aggression, seeing the energy crisis we have, especially in Europe, but also in other parts of the world, um, is that we were uh, too naive and too dependent uh, on fossil energies coming from Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, the ramp up of renewables but also um, investment in research and development of other kinds of decarbonized sustainable energy forms as e-fuels or, for example, fusion energy uh, is a huge topic in European Union. And so all the uh, resolutions and decisions in European Parliament for a moment says, yes, we have to deal with this war, but this means not that we uh, took apart the Green Deal and green transition and also digitalization, so the digital transition as a tool for green transition. Mm. Uh, so we really try to do it in the same time mm. uh, to be more diversified. And this is also something I think that we are searching uh, for a partnership uh, here also in the region. And what for me was really uh, interesting, and I will take this back uh, to Europe for a follow-up with the colleague there and the colleagues here. Uh, for example, that in the bilateral with the Indonesian colleagues, we were speaking about how cooperate on CO2 emissions. So because you have with your forests possibilities to think CO2 to emissions, so that get out of the atmosphere, mm. uh, where, which are produced somewhere else in the world. And we have a tool with the ETS uh, certificate trade system which is market-driven and could make really a circular economy on CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, so gaining money or paying money, uh, depending on whether you use CO2 emissions or you can uh, stick uh, and think uh, CO2 emissions. So I think uh, a big possibility uh, for Indonesia, for example, becoming a hub uh, mm -hmm. in that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will follow up on this topic. Mm -hmm. And I really hope that we can get there in a common solution also on the international level. Yeah. Uh, Nicola, you are a politician and you've been a politician for 20 years, right? And, uh, you know, we observe that in many democracies, uh, no matter what the political system is, uh, we are seeing many cases of uh, erosion of the democracies, mm -hmm. uh, more polarization. We see in this in the U.S. Uh, especially. Uh, more money politics uh, going on and uh, trust towards uh, institutions uh, are declining. Uh, in some cases, the uh, rule of law uh, is becoming less applicable. Uh, 
so I'm just, I, I want to ask you as a politician in Europe, right? Uh, yes, you have the, uh, the elections and, and so on, but what is the state of the quality of democracy mm. in, in Europe? Are you happy with it or you think uh, there are things that should be fixed urgently? On the first point, of course, I'm happy uh, having the chance to live in a democracy mm. on a continent which has now peace because we have stable democracies mm. in all the member states. But uh, on the second point, and, and this is for me very visible, I mean, democracy is not something you can install once and then forget about it uh, and just have the advantages from. You have to fight it for it each day mm -hmm. and in, in, in every surrounding because it's something which just trickles away if you're not aware that you have to fight for it and yet you have also to stand for it even if it's complicated mm -hmm. and yes uh, I also live it in those 20 years that the discussion also the political discussion but also discussion in the society becomes more and more aggressive um, that populism is rising on the right side, on the left side, on the left side, on the right side, even non-political populism. Um, I do not know if this is or how far it is in influenced by the fact that communication became quicker and quicker. Mm. And I started as a parliamentarian, so there was a journalist calling you a question, and then you had two hours uh, just to prepare an answer because you know that the conference of the TV channel was in the afternoon and so you can look and have some research about the question even if the question was valid or not, if the case was valid or not and then you prepared and you send a, a fax <laughs> to the journalist with the answer. Today, sometimes you even do not have three minutes. This triggers not at every level quality uh, not the quality of your answer, not the quality of the discussion. And this uh, acceleration uh, makes it also that you get more through if you have a very polarized attitude in what question you were asked. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Then this is popular, then you just beat him. Uh, mm -hmm. But my experience after so long time serving on different levels of parliaments mm -hmm. and governments is that this may be good for a show in the media, mm -hmm. but it doesn't solve problem of citizens. Yeah. So really to work on a solution which makes the biggest number of citizens uh, in the biggest consent is another kind of work. And it's not by some tweets yet to get there. And so to manage this, so because for the elections I have to be popular. Mm -hmm. I have to get some votes. Uh, mm -hmm. And in the same time, having also the capacity to work behind the scenes because I want that the problem is solved for the citizens. I, I, I want to pick up on that point because uh, like every politician in the world, especially in democracies, uh, experience what you're saying that uh, they, they have to be uh, popular, they have to raise noise and uh, do a lot of posturing, right? Uh, because that's how you get attention, right? But you have to get things done as well, right? So how do you get that balance? Because I see some politicians just make too much noise. Uh, they do social media every day, TikTok, they dance around, but they don't do their work, they don't achieve anything yet. So how do you do, how do, you do both? How do you enchant your constituents and get things done at the same time? Yeah. My husband is always complaining, let it take me from this side, uh, that I'm maybe one of the last person thinking that content matters in politics. Mm -hmm. So that I'm not making enough noise, uh, to put it that way. Mm. Uh, I think for me, the content is much more important than the noise. Mm -hmm. So we try to up make more noise the nearer the election comes. Mm. Uh, so the noise you have to make in your parliament, in your uh, uh, political group, so that you are on the list for the next elections, uh, and then the noise you have to go out with your voters. But what I see is that also kinds um, things like credibility accounting for voters, 
mm. and that more and more citizens come up saying, no, I know you are engaged on that, for example, fight against discrimination since years and decades. So this is credible, even if maybe on this topic we have another opinion. But I think you do a good work. And I, this is what I'm aiming for. And so, yes, I have a very good team and they just balance it out that the content is prepared, but that we have also press release and social media activities. But I'm not doing everything and I'm not the clown for that because I think this is bad also for credibility of politics in common. Good. Uh, I know you, uh, you have to go and we are at the end, but I have to ask you this question. Uh, so these are young people. Uh, 20s, uh, I'm the oldest guy here. <laughs> uh, Maybe it's me. <laughs> and in Indonesian, uh, in Indonesian uh, politics, uh, majority of young people say, I don't want to go into politics. Mm -hmm. It's just too dirty. It's too this, too that. I have my idealism. I cannot sell out and so on, right? But I do think young people need to get more into politics, especially the good young people, right, who have solutions, who are idealistic. So how, what do you say to them <laughs> that, look, you know, don't stay away, uh, grab the bull by the horn and change things? Yeah. Well, I, as a I, politician, I just, what do you say to yeah, them? Yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's only dirty if you let the others do. Mm -hmm. If you are engaged in another way, so it will not be dirty. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it's the most important you can do as you stand up for citizens which might not be able to do so. So and especially as it's your future. I mean, we <laughs> are from another generation deciding on your future. I think you should decide on your own. You have your ideas. You can shape and decide what you want to do, uh, is done in the next centuries. Mm -hmm. And so just engage because everybody who is not engaging uh, in the election by being a candidate or just by discussing in families with friends or whatever, he let the other decide. And me personally, I could never dare that only others decide on my future. So you should engage. Yeah. Nicola, thank you very much. Let's give a big hand. <laughs> thank you for visiting us and I hope you come back to see us in Indonesia. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you very thank much. You. All right. Thank you, Dr. Dino. Once again, thank you, the Honorable Nicola Beer, for the insightful and informative session we had.